What's going on guys? We're back in the shed for another Shed Sessions installational video. Now it's fair to say for this video today, I am completely out of my depth on this one guys. So in saying that, let's get stuck into it. Alrighty guys, so today we're gonna to be installing a suspension kit on my MP300. Now, the reason why I'm out of my element on this one is because I normally install suspension upgrade kits on solid axle vehicles. The MP300 uses the independent front suspension setup. So I've only done like one other vehicle with independent front suspension before, which means that I don't have a lot of experience in this area. So I reckon today this video should probably be labeled, let's do this suspension kit together because I'm gonna be learning just as much as you guys are. Rightio, so what we've got on the parts table today is a complete comp shock upgrade suspension kit for the MP300. So this has been supplied to me by parts man Dan. Now Dan's been doing suspension kits for a very long time. He's had a lot of knowledge in the industry and he's put all of that knowledge into his own brand, the comp shocks, and made them to be a spectacular product. Alrighty guys, let's start with the shiniest part on the bench, the rear shocks. So these are set up with a remote reservoir canister on them. Now this remote reservoir is good for helping with cooling the shock absorber. So off-road conditions, touring, corrugated roads, things like that, the shock's gonna get quite hot and having the remote reservoir canister on there is going to give the fluid more space to move around and cool itself. You've also got the adjuster here. So you can adjust the rate of the shock itself to soft and hard, medium and everything in between to get the desired feel that you're after. So these are the front strut assemblies. Now, as you can see, they are pre-assembled, ready to go straight into the vehicle. If you're doing this installation at home, guys, this is a massive advantage. It means that you don't have to have a spring compressor machine to be able to adjust or assemble the spring height. These are pre-assembled to suit the particular lift that you've inquired about. So mine, in, in this case, is three inches. So that is suited for a three inch lift. Now, the other thing to note, when you are getting someone to do your suspension setups, you need to let them know the weight of the vehicle, or at the very least what's installed on the vehicle. So for instance, I've got an aftermarket bull bar and also a winch on the front here. I'm probably gonna be installing some lights and stuff down the track as well. So I've let Dan know that information so that he could set this spring setup to suit the weight of the vehicle. So for the smart ones that bought an MP300, we get coils in the back of our utes. So these are the coils that have been supplied with the kit. Now these are a long travel setup to suit the long travel shocks for the rear as well, which means that I'm gonna get better articulation downward uh, and get more droop into things like ruts for off-road situations and stuff like that. Now, like the front struts, you need to make sure the rear coils, you've let the person know who's setting them up for you, what weight you have on your vehicle. So you need to let them know things like draw setups, fridges, rear bars, any bar work. Uh, and bigger tires, things like that. Alrighty, so now getting onto the upper control arm. So these are a genuine SPC upper control arm kit. Now, the control arms are a very important piece of an IFS suspension install package. If you're going over two inches of lift, you generally will need upper control arms. Basically with an IFS setup, the control arms are meant to sit pretty much like this. When you put a bigger spring in the front and lift the vehicle, they start moving a bit more like this and it means that it's going to limit your down travel and also the clearance on your strut tower itself. Now these also come with uh, adjustable ball joint setup. Now these are a genuine SPC ball joint don't get caught out with the cheaper knockoffs. These are a very strong, sturdy part. So basically these are fully adjustable in the way that on the top here, you can move them around on the upper control arm to suit different camber offsets. So when you lift the vehicle, basically the camber of the tire is going to move inward like this. So what you need to do is change the location of that uh, ball joint there and pull the wheel back out so that it's flat on the road. So. Generally speaking, you will need to get a wheel alignment or something done to your vehicle after installing these, but that setup will give the person doing the wheel alignment the opportunity to get all of your camber and everything set up properly uh, to suit the suspension lift that you put on the vehicle. So they are extremely important. And once again, like everything with this kit, everything you need is included in that package to install them straight in, including the grease. So with the remote reservoir canisters, we'll take a look when we're installing onto the vehicle at a location that we can put them, but what is included in this kit is brackets to be able to mount them straight onto the vehicle somewhere. So everything you need is there, including all the bracketry bits and pieces and fasteners. There's also some sway bar extension brackets here. Uh, when we get underneath the vehicle, we'll figure out how to mount those ones on. 
Now we've got the headlight adjuster bracket. This bracket will go on the back of the diff. So it's got multiple drilled holes in the bracket here. That's allowing you to change the angle of the headlight adjuster to suit two inch, three inch, four inch lift, things like that, so that you can make sure that the headlights are adjusting to a factory height. Alrighty guys, so we've taken a look what's included in the kit. It's time to jump into the installation and see how it's installed into the MP300. So before we touch anything on the vehicle, you need to take measurements of how the vehicle is sitting height wise at the moment. So we need to take measurements from all four corners. So that's uh, front, left and right, and rear, left and right as well. So the way to take the measurement is grab a tape measure. Now you want to measure from the center of the guard there down to the bottom of the rim. So I'm getting 796 mil. So I'm going to note that down on my notepad here. So front right hand side, 796 millimeters. And now I'm gonna go and do the rest of the four corners, guys. Okay, so that's all four measurements now taken from my vehicle. So I've got on the right hand side, driver's side front is 796, left hand side front is 786, rear is 818 millimeters on the right hand side, driver's side, and left is 811 millimeters. So what we can do with these is once we've installed the suspension kit, we can compare the measurements and see how high the vehicle has been lifted. Now, I'm just gonna make a note that on my vehicle, I do have 35 mil strut spaces. I did that to try and level things out a little bit in the meantime, why I didn't have a suspension lift in the vehicle. So your measurements might be a little bit different if your vehicle's still sitting on factory suspension. Rightio guys, we're gonna start on the front suspension first. So start by ripping off both left and right wheels off the vehicle. Rightio guys, so we're just gonna break down the front end a little bit. So when I'm referring to something, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So we'll start at the top. So up here is your upper control arm and you've also got your lower control arm down here. Okay, and that one there is your steering knuckle. Now that's connected up here by the ball joint onto the upper control arm. And over here, we've got the tie rod. Now that's basically controlling the steering uh, left to right. So that's connected to your steering linkage. Then you've got your sway bar uh, over here, which has got your sway bar linkage down here as well. Now in here is your main strut. So that incorporates your shock and your spring. Now it's bolted on the top and there's a bolt through the bottom down here. Tucked behind the strut is your CVs. Uh, you've got a few other bits and pieces like you've got your wheel speed sensor line here. You've also got your brake line tucked away up the back. And I think that's about all that we really need to talk about, uh, anything that we're gonna to be touching on this install. So first things first, guys, we need to remove the sway bar so that we can get movement up and down. Okay, so you wanna grab a breaker bar and a 17 mil socket. This nut might be tight, so it's better to have a breaker bar just in case. So do that on both sides of the vehicle. Once you've done the passenger side, you just wanna pull the linkage out and pull the sway bar down. Rightio, so we're gonna start on the upper control arm. Now we need to crack the nuts off on either side. So there's two bolts here, one on either side. We need to crack those nuts off now because as soon as we take out the steering knuckle, this whole upper control arm is gonna pivot up and it's gonna be really hard to get into there to crack the bolt. On the left-hand side here, the side closest to the cab, there's a bolt in here which will foul on the steering arm. So it's going to be a bit of a pain in the ass to get out. I know SPC have supplied a replacement bolt. So you'll notice in your SPC kit, there'll be one bolt in there and it looks like it belongs to nothing, but it's actually, so if you need to cut the head off this bolt in order to get it out, uh, you have a replacement bolt there. So we'll try and squeeze it out and see if we can remove it without cutting it. But if it comes to cutting it, that's what we'll have to do. So you're gonna to need to grab yourself some 19, uh, some 19 mil spanners, two of them, because both uh, the bolt head and the nut are 19 mil, or a breaker bar with a 19 mil socket because they're probably gonna be super tight. Okay, so we've just grabbed the jack and we've put the jack underneath the steering knuckle because we're gonna be dropping the ball joint bolt off here, which means that the steering knuckle itself is just gonna drop down. So this jack is going to support it from dropping all the way down. Now you can support the steering knuckle with a zip tie or some sort of cable tie itself to the body of the vehicle. Now there is a split pin on this, uh, on this bolt for the ball joint, so you're just gonna to have to remove that one. We wanna make sure that any of the lines that are connected to the steering mechanism here are removed so that when the whole mechanism drops down, we don't tear those lines. So the main line that I can see here that we need to remove is the wheel speed sensor line here. Now that's just got a couple of rubber grommets that are holding it into metal brackets 
up along the steering knuckle. So you can just pull those ones out the whole way up. Okay, so once you've done that, you need to grab yourself a breaker bar and a 22 mil socket. So the nut on here is 22 mil. It's not going to be overly tight, so you should be able to get it loose with a breaker bar, no worries at all. Okay, so once this is out, once this nut's off, this upper control arm will lift up and away. So the ball joint comes out of the steering knuckle and then the steering knuckle itself is going to want to move outward but it looks like it's pretty comfortable sitting there. So now we can see what we're working with. Okay, so this bolt is definitely not coming out easily. So it's fouling on the steering arm here. So we can't get it all the way out. It's pretty damn close, but it just won't come all the way. So we can either do one of two things. We can chop the head off the bolt, uh, which is going to be pretty hard to get in there with uh, a grinder and a cutting wheel. You'd probably have to use like an air saw or something like that. So we might use that as an option, but I have been um, given a hot tip from Sam at Aura Automotive up in Queensland who installs a lot of these kits. He's the, uh, he's the Comp Shock dealer up in Queensland. So he's just let me know that if you unbolt this steering linkage from here and pull it out of the way, it, it's quite easy to do. And just put a, uh, a seat belt around the steering wheel to stop the steering wheel from moving around uh, itself and, and you know, meaning that this will move around and the linkage won't line up again. So uh, put the seat belt around the steering wheel and then undo this bolt here, which is a 14 mil bolt and just pry this open a little bit, pull the linkage out, pull the bolt out and put it straight back together and do the 14 mil bolt up again and you'll be good to go. That's probably the easiest way and less messy way I reckon guys. So let's have a crack at doing that and see how it goes. <laughs> All right, so it needed a little bit of manipulation to come out, but that's a linkage now off and out of the way. So that we can pull that bolt out. It's still a bit of a pain in the ass to get to, but with a bit of bit of wiggling, it's uh it's come out. So that's the bolt, guys. There, um, that's the steering arm that we've had to take off. Now you can see that the notch in it that faces uh, the same way. It hasn't moved. This hasn't spun around any. So. That's good, just need to make sure this is still facing the same way you took it off because the bolt goes back through and the bolt basically stops on here. I'll show you. So it's got the locators on the bolt itself, uh, which locate on that. Now again, guys, this is, this is just an option. So you can cut that bolt head off if you wanted to. I just was preferring not to make a mess and put metal shavings into the engine bay. So this for me was probably a bit harder, but more of a preferred option just for the mess factor. So let's go ahead and put that one back on and then you can rem remove the seat belt from the steering wheel. The pin just goes straight down to the back of the linkage and it just pushes straight in without too much effort. So I sort of had it coming out a little bit towards the front before, which is making it hard. But um, if yeah, it just, it just likes to slide out this way. So down this way and likes to go back in the same way as well. There's enough room in there for it to slide straight back in and then just put the bolt through and you're good to go. Now the bolt does only go in one way screw the nut on, and then we'll turn the steering wheel around so that the nut's facing down again, and we'll do it up. So that is the bolt out of the left side of the upper control arm. So now we just need to go ahead and get the other bolt out on the right hand side, and that upper control arm will come right out of the vehicle. There'll be nothing stopping this bolt from coming out, thankfully. That one is super easy and the whole upper control arm assembly will just pull straight out of the vehicle. Now, nothing on this arm is going to be reused. Okay, so the only thing now that's holding the assembly up from falling down is obviously a jack, but if that jack wasn't there, it is the strut. So the strut's got the bolt through the bottom and the three bolts on top. So it's kind of holding this whole piece still upright and together. And that's exactly why we have to have the jack here for this part especially, is because this whole assembly is going to want to fall down now once we take this strut out. Okay, so the bolt head is 22 mil and the bolt nut on the other side is 19. So I've got an impact socket 19 and 22 mil lever bar socket here just to hold the other side. Okay, so before we remove this bolt completely, we're gonna undo the three nuts on the top of the strut and have them off so it all comes away nicely and isn't under any tension.
Okay, so that's the three top nuts off the strut tower. Now, let's go ahead and take this bottom bolt out. You might need to take a little bit of pressure off the jack. Just like that. Okay, that's the bottom bolt out. And the whole assembly will just come out as one piece. Now, as I was saying before, I've got strut spaces on the top where I was trying to level the vehicle out to match the, um, to match the back, because it did sag down a little bit at the front from factory, especially when I put the bar work on, on the front there. So there are 35 mil strut space that's in there now. So um, yeah, that all still comes out as one piece. Yours will look a little bit different without this gold piece on top, and it will be a bit short, obviously. So you won't have to let it drop down as much to get it out. But that's pretty much the whole strut assembly out now, guys. So let's move on to the next step. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a comparison. So this is the factory upper control arm. This is the new aftermarket one with extra clearance and it also has bigger bushes in it as well. And this provision in here to allow the ball joint to slide up and down inside the mount. So that is the aftermarket SPC control arm, upper control arm. Now these are the strut towers. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of difference between the two. Um, so from the uh, hat, hat to hat, now you've got to remember this gold piece on here is an extension to the uh, factory strut uh, assembly that I've got here. So the top of the hat actually is down here and that's uh, the same onto this one here as well. So you can see there's quite a bit of difference there between the two uh, and obviously the quality difference as well, the strut body itself, the shock uh, size and the spring size, the overall quality of the shock is, uh, is far better. And that goes uh, for the SPC upper control arm as well. You can tell it's just a stronger, more durable four-wheel drive product. So you can use this on both sides of the vehicle. It doesn't really matter which arm goes on which side. You just need to make sure if it's on the driver's side, you have the R for right facing upward, so you can see it and you've got it on the right side. If it's on the passenger side, you just need to have the L facing up, so it's on the left-hand side of the vehicle. Now this kit comes with absolutely everything you need and it also comes with very detailed instruction manuals. So make sure you have a read through those so that you set this up properly. Uh, now, this is the adjustable ball joint. Now, this ball joint removed the nut and the washer because they go on top, but the ball joint itself is adjustable. And this is to help with the camber of the vehicle, getting that camber to be set up properly. So this plate here, you can change the angle of it to different ways. So the way that we need to install this to suit a three or four inch lift kit is having the plate uh, angled that way. And that's the, best, uh, that's the best way to start off. Now, we need to push the ball joint itself all the way to the back of the upper control arm and put your washer on and then your nut and tighten things down. So I have to tighten that up properly. Now that's the best starting location for this setup. So I've been told by Sam at Aura Automotive. So that is a good spot to start with because you can leave the top in that position. And then on the lower control arm, you have the adjuster for the camber. So you have the dials, which you can adjust the bolts on the camber when you get, when you get the wheel alignment done. Okay, so each arm comes with two pivot sleeves. Now these pivot sleeves need to be pushed into the bushing. Now you need to use the grease that's supplied, only the supplied grease because it is the proper stuff for these bushes. Now you need to lubricate the inside of the bushes pretty thoroughly. So squeeze, squeeze a bit of the tube in there. And then just get your finger and push it around the whole inside of the bush, making sure you get it into all grooves inside the bush. And then once you've done that, you need to smear a little bit on the outside face, so not the inside faces, just the outside faces, and put a bit around the outside as well, because that face does come in contact with a metal part on the upper control arm bracket, so if it's not lubricated, it will squeak. And once you've done that, grab one of your sleeves, and these are just a push fit. You don't need to press or anything like that. They just slide straight in. A little bit of grease will come out the other side. That's fine. Just grab that and put it on the face if you want to. And just make sure that the sleeve itself is pretty flush on both sides of the bush. And repeat that on the other side of the upper control arm. So we're going to have to put the upper control arm in the vehicle and test it up and down and see exactly where we need to get some clearance for this to move freely in the vehicle. So it's not too hard, but you will need an angle grinder and a flapper disc or something like that to be able to cut away a bit of the strut tower to get the clearance that you need. Okay, so we just put the upper control arm in for a bit of a test fit. Now we just put the bolts through. Haven't really put any nuts on the other side. You can if you want to, but you don't really need to for this part. So we've just test fitted it. Now we can see straight away that that uh, ball joint here is going to have some clearance issues on the strut tower. So we're gonna have to get a paint pen and just mark that portion there where it's hitting 
and we're going to have to do some trimming down there and I think we'll have to do a little bit of trimming just up here as well. Maybe a couple of mil just off this front face and we're going to have to take a fair chunk out of this back radius out here. Okay, so now we've put some paint marks where we need to uh, do some grinding. Let's take the upper control arm out again so we don't get it all dusted up with grinding dust. And uh, we'll do uh, some grinding on this section of the strut tower itself. And then we'll put the upper control arm back in and see how it fits. Right here guys, so that's the strut tower now linished back for clearance on the ball joint and the upper control arm. So as you saw, I had to take the upper control arm out and put it back in once more and then do a little bit more grinding afterwards. So it might take you a couple of tries to get the clearance uh, spot on. That doesn't matter. You just need to take it in and out as many times as you need to get that ball joint to clear. On my strut tower here, I've had to take out probably the most meat from this back section, probably about 30 odd mil I've taken out off that, uh, off that strut tower itself. And then up the front, I've just taken a little bit more off this section here, and then a couple of mil just over the whole radius itself. But mainly uh, around this section up the back here, I've taken the most of the most meat out for clearance on the ball joint. So now I'm ready to do the uh, final fitment of the upper control arm. But before we do that, just make sure you give the area a spray down with a spray gun and a clean down with a cloth and some uh, cleaner, and then grab yourself some paint and uh, give that section of paint so it doesn't rust up. And then once you've done that, we'll put the upper control arm back in and then we'll move on to the strut. Now grab the original upper control arm bolts and nuts. So those ones up. Just give it a wiggle until it goes into place. Give it a wiggle. And then grab the nuts and put the nuts on the bolts. Now we don't want to do these ones up tight, just finger tight for now. We'll do them all up once we get on the ground at ride height. Rightio, so because we've got a lot more down travel and side to side movement with the suspension kit, this tab here, which held the uh, wheel speed sensor cable, that grommet went on there, uh, we're gonna have to cut this tab off because it's gonna get in the way. And this brake line holder here, this bracket, is going to have to be bent backward as well, just to be able to get the extra clearance. So we'll have to check the clearance on this brake line bracket. Once we've got everything in, we'll move it around and just bend it back, that's not a problem. But this one does need to be cut off now before we install the strut. <laughs> Righto guys, so it's time to install the strut assembly. So basically this strut assembly comes pre-assembled, like I said, in everything that you need to install it straight into the car. So on the top hat here, you've got the studs with the three nuts. You can take those nuts off, keep them aside because they will go back on once we've installed it onto the car. Now these nuts do have a serrated back on them as well, so they don't need any Loctite or anything with those they are good to go. Now on the bottom of the strut assembly, you've got the uh, bottom strut bolt here. So you just reuse the factory bolt that we removed off the factory strut assembly, put that one back in and uh, you're good to go. So there is an orientation to the way this goes in though. So there's two bolts uh, on the back here, which are closer together and one here, which is further away from the rest. So that one that's further away from the other two goes towards the front of the strut uh, on the vehicle. So basically goes in like that. Okay, so once you've got the top hat studs through there, just put some nuts on the top loosely. Don't have to do them up tight just yet. That'll just hold everything in place for now. Okay, now we've got to line up the bottom bolt. So with the bottom bolt, you might need to lower the jack down in order for the whole assembly, the whole uh, lower control arm assembly and everything to drop down to line up the bottom hole. It can help to do up these top, uh, top hat bolts as well to pull everything up. So if you need to do that, do up these top, um, top hat bolts now and get the bottom bolt in. Now just do the bottom bolt up loosely. The top hat bolts can be done up tight, but the bottom bolt needs to be done up once the vehicle's at ride height on the ground. Okay, so those top strut, uh, top hat bolts have been done up, so grab a paint pen and just put a mark on them so that you know that they've been done up tight. 
So do that with any bolt that you've um, you've done up so that you know that it's been done. Just put a mark between the nut and the uh, bolt itself. Okay, so go ahead and grab the steering knuckle and the upper control arm with the ball joint and just put the ball joint pin back into the steering knuckle and grab the supplied nut that comes with the SPC upper control arm kit and there's also a cotter pin. Keep that aside for now and put the nut on. You can do up the uh, nut on the ball joint. So you can do that up till it's tight. So you'll feel it start seating on the tapered uh, ball, uh, ball joint pin. So it will start getting tight and then you go a little bit further than that. You need to basically line up the nut with the hole that's in the ball joint pin uh, to where the cotter pin goes through on the bottom of the nut there. So don't go too high, otherwise it will be too high for the cotter pin to go through and it won't actually be through the nut, it'll be below it. Get that one done up, put your cotter pin through and uh, then you need to go through and put on your vehicle, your wheel speed sensor lines that we pulled off. So those grommets just go straight back into those metal brackets. Now there is the bracket that we had to cut off the top here. Now that um, line can be cable tied uh, somewhere up the top there, but it does have another mount just above it. So it shouldn't be too much of a problem just to maybe cable tie it in somewhere around that brake line. Okay, so now we're gonna have to modify this uh, brake line bracket here. This is gonna have to be hit backwards and bent backwards out of the way. So when the steering's moving left to right, you can see that the steering knuckle is coming in contact with the brake line. So we need to get that out of the way by giving it a hit on the, on the side here and pushing that brake line bracket backwards. Alrighty guys, so that is everything now installed back into the suspension assembly. So we've relocated a couple of lines there. We've had to move that brake line lastly. Now we've done up a couple of nuts and bolts, so make sure you've already done up those ones. Now the ones that shouldn't be done up yet is the lower strut bolt. So the one down here on the lower control arm and the upper control arm bolts up the back here. Both of those need to be done up at ride height, guys. So, and you can also do the sway bar back up when it's at ride height as well. It might be a little bit easier. If you remove the tie rod, make sure you put that uh, back on now and also with a cotter pin as well. Make sure you've got a cotter pin in the bottom of your ball joint uh, to steering knuckle arm here. So you've got the cotter pin back on there and that nut should be done up tight. The top nut on the UCA ball joint should be done up as well. Uh, we will need to grease that as well before we uh, finish up. So we need to grease that ball joint. And that should be about it, guys. Make sure once you've done up all of the bolts, just mark them with a paint pen. Put a mark between the nut and the bolt itself so you know if it moves, you can tell if it's moved or not. And you know that it's been done as well. So basically, you need to go and mirror this on the other side of the vehicle. Do exactly the same thing. It's going to be easier as well because you don't have to worry about the steering arm getting in the way or the linkage getting in the way of that bolt on the upper control arm. So it's even easier again, guys. So that's the front uh, suspension setup now done. We'll put the wheels back on. We'll drop it down to ride height and tie up those few bolts that need to be done and then we'll get into the back suspension setup. So that's the front end now done. There's a lot of moving parts in that front end, guys. It is a hectic job to say the least. You are way better off paying someone to do it, to be perfectly honest with you. But if you wanna have a crack at it at home, hopefully this video is showing you at least some of the information on what it takes to get this suspension kit installed onto the front IFS vehicle. Now, that isn't a walk in the park, guys, but the rear end is quite easy. The Probably the hardest part about the rear end is finding a way to mount the reservoir canisters um, using the brackets because there is no proper place. It's really wherever you want to put it. So I'll have to try and figure that out. Now, um, I have to address the lighting in here, guys. So it isn't daylight savings in Victoria anymore. Daylight savings is over and it's gotten dark a lot quicker than I thought it would. I started way too late on this build, guys, but I'm going to keep pushing forward because I really want to try and get this one done today. So grab your springs, your rear shocks, your headlight adjuster bracket, your reservoir mounting brackets, the clamps, 
the rubber mounting provisions for the reservoirs and the bolts and stuff to go with the headlight bracket. So first things first on the back of the vehicle, we need to check to make sure that there's no lines that are gonna be stretched or broken when we drop the diff down. Uh, so if you're doing this on the ground, you'll just have jack stands on the chassis and you'll have a jack underneath the rear diff lifting it up and down. It's pretty much the same thing as what I'm doing here, but this gives me the opportunity to show you guys with a bit more space what's going on. We're gonna start by taking off the rear sway bar. So that's the first thing to remove. Okay, so what you're gonna to need to do is grab a 17 mil socket and uh, or spanner and undo the links off the chassis and that rear sway bar assembly will just drop down. Alrighty guys, so that is the rear sway bar now removed. So when we need to drop the rear diff down, it's gonna come down easily without being restricted. Much like when you're off-road, if you wanna get more flex out of the rear end, you can remove the rear sway bar and things are gonna move around a lot more. So, uh, I forgot to mention, on the back end, you don't need to remove the tires for this one. Unlike the front where we need to get into the IFS setup behind the tire, we can get to everything we need with the tires on. So leave those ones on guys, one less thing for you to have to do. So that's pretty much it there. I reckon what we're gonna do now is get stuck into putting the headlight adjuster bracket on here. So replacing this uh, bracket with the one suited for a lifted vehicle. So this is the adjuster bracket, which picks up on the factory bolt holes down here on the bottom. Uh, that goes onto the diff assembly, basically just picks up the factory spots. And then this bracket here goes on the back using the factory bolt goes back through there. And then this goes onto the top of the diff. There's a bolt location on there. And that's just basically an extra support bracket, which you'll see when we install it. Now, this bracket itself has a few different mounting hole locations. So down the bottom here, you've got two inch, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, four and a half, maybe upward, I'm guessing, I'm not sure. So for me, I'm doing a measly little two inch lift kit on the back. So I'm picking up this bottom bolt hole for my headlight adjuster bracket. Now I do have a long travel kit that I'm using. So it, to take a bit of stress off the arm, I might actually pick up the two and a half, uh, two and a half inch lifts location because my down travel and that sort of stuff is going to be greater. So my open and close lengths on my shock is greater than a normal setup. Okay, so let's go ahead and remove the bolts off the factory bracket. So the bottom one there is a 13 and the top one is a 10. It is a nylock nut, so nylock nuts are painful. They hold tension all the way to the end, so it is there. Now this bolt is basically a retaining bolt holding the handbrake cable onto the top of the diff. And it looks like on the bracket kit that comp shocks have supplied, it picks up on this bolt location for extra support because the bracket is a fair bit taller. These are the bolts that we've removed off the car and these are the ones that are supplied in the kit. So we need to use this bolt set up here with a nylock on one side. So bolt goes through. That one there, bracket goes on. Let's just leave that one fairly loose. Might just tighten it up a little bit so it's not wiggling around too much. Might It might just be good to have a bit of movement in this bracket so that when we're putting it onto that location, we can move it around if we need to. So it's not completely tightened down, it's still movable. So we can adjust the uh, angle if need be. Now, uh, existing bolt, goes in there, that one goes back into that uh, top mount on the handbrake cable, and existing bolt in the bottom through there. Now there is this extra bolt which goes into there. So that's, a, that's one that's supplied uh, from uh, comp shocks with this bracket. So it's basically an extra bolt to pick up on the location that's already on the diff. So the factory didn't have one in there, um, so they've just given a, an extra one for a bit of extra support. Done. It's time to take the shocks off the diff. Now make sure for this part you have your diff supported. 
As soon as you take those shocks off, the whole diff is gonna drop down. The shocks are actually what holds the diff up into place. Uh, the arms obviously stop it from traveling too far down, but the arms aren't going to stop it from dropping. So make sure you've got something underneath the diff for this part. You really need to have a jack underneath there, something that's adjustable in height, because we will need to lower it down even further to get the springs out and then put the new springs in. So uh, the shock bolts are gonna be super tight, so make sure you bring your elbow grease and they're both 19 mil. Yeah, 19 mil either side. <sighs> Far out. Probably use a rattle gun on those if you've got it, guys. For the sake of this exercise, I'm not gonna use one just to show what tools you can use at home. Break a bar, spanner, but that was tight. <laughs> Alrighty, so that's that one off. Shall I just put the nut back on for now until we get the top one? So let's get a 17 mil socket for the top one. Pretty sure it's 17. Yep, sure is. Oh, top ones aren't that bad. Nowhere near as bad as the bottom. So once you've got the top bolt off, you just need to go and slide out the bottom bolt and the shock comes free. And just wiggle it off the top one. Oh, don't hit your thumb on the exhaust system. Whew. That sucked. Exhaust system though, guys, that leads me to another question. I have no idea what I need to do with this exhaust system, whether or not I get an aftermarket one. Uh, there's a few good ones out there that are, you know, they sound awesome, but I'm not sure whether or not to do that or whether you guys want to see me make a custom exhaust system. If you want to see me make a custom one, I have all the gear here to do it. If you have some ideas, throw them at me guys and we'll try something and see how it sounds and, you know, throw them in the comments below and we'll, we'll chat, we'll, ch we'll chat about it. I want some ideas, guys. I want to know what to do. Otherwise, I'm just going to be lazy and buy one. But that's okay, too. If you guys want to see me put a particular brand on, let me know. I'll put it on. Let's jump onto the other side. <laughs> So that is the rear shocks out. So you can see there is quite a bit of difference in the shock body size compared to the comp shocks. They're a lot bigger body to them, which means they've got a lot bigger uh, capacity for oil, cooling, uh, all that sort of stuff. And obviously the open and close lengths of the shock is quite different as well. Now, make sure you keep your bolts as well. So your factory bolts that we've just taken off because we will have to reuse those ones, guys. Uh, all right, let's get the springs out. You guys are probably on the ground. So you're just gonna lower the diff down on the jack Keep going down until you can get the springs out. If that means you've got to take off the tires or lift up the jack stands a little bit higher on the chassis, do so. For me, I'm going to be lifting up the vehicle on the hoist, and that means that the diff's going to stay, stay where it is, hopefully, and as the body goes up, the springs will be able to drop out. Whoa! One spring. Two springs. Okay, so when I was lowering the diff down before, I noticed that the brake lines were getting close to stretching out to their limits. So I'm going to have to unclip them from their brackets on the bottom here to try and give them a little bit more reach so I can lower it down enough to get the new coils in. Now, after doing this suspension installation, even on the front and on the rear, I've noticed that the brake lines are not long enough. So I had a feeling they weren't going to be, so I've ordered a set and they are on their way, guys. So for now, whilst on the road, it won't be a problem having the factory brake lines, but as soon as I get off-road and the diff starts flexing around and drooping down, those brake lines are going to be stretched and they're gonna break. So I need to get a longer set of brake lines on there to give it the flex and everything that it needs. So that'll be coming up soon, but for the time being, to get around it, we're just gonna undo these clips and drop the dip, diff down and then put the coils in. Rightio, guys, so these are the two springs. This is a new spring, this is the old spring we've just taken out. So you can see there's definitely a height difference between the two. So that's where you're getting your lift from, basically. The, the longer spring is going to lift the vehicle higher. In most cases, when a spring's made and manufactured, basically it's heated up metal and it's, it's, it's coiled. It's coiled in a fashion where it's sprung for a certain application. So sometimes you'll have linear coils, flexi coils, long travel coils, all sorts of different setups, and they're basically sprung to suit. So the, this coil will compress in a certain way and the coil, another coil will compress in a different way. For instance, super flexi coils, you'll see a lot of tightly woven coils and that, that will basically compress and it will compress really close together. And then when you're off road and, it's, and everything's flexing around, those coils will open right up and give it lots of stretch. But on the flip side, on the road, they feel like a bucket of 
shit. So <laughs> having something like a hybrid between a linear coil and you know a bit of a flexi coil is really good to have because you get the comfort plus you get the performance off-road. So this setup is really, really good. Anyway, guys, so that's just a bit of a comparison between the two coils. Now we need to get stuck into putting the new coils in, then the shocks. Okay, guys, so go ahead and grab your spring. Now the part numbers on them don't really say left or right. They're both exactly the same, so I'm assuming that they go on either side. So grab your top hat rubber. Now this has an indentation in it where the last spring was seated, so get the top of the spring, that bit there, seated into the same spot, so it'd be about there. Now obviously that's the top and that's the bottom. Alrighty guys, so I've been doing a bit of playing around with these rear shock assemblies and reservoirs and mounting and all that sort of stuff. So these are the brackets that, uh, that are supplied with the kit. Uh, obviously these are for the reservoirs like we've spoken about. Now those brackets can go in multiple places on the car. There's somewhere on there on the, t on the tub itself where Sam from uh, Aura Automotive uh, up in Queensland recommended to put them and they would fit really nicely up in that position. But I've been playing around with a uh, setup like this. So I'm using the mounting bushes that are supplied and the uh, hose clamps uh, there as well, which this is extremely solid and not going anywhere. And I haven't even done up these hose clamps properly yet. They're not super tight. I was just tinkering around. So that could be an option for you guys. If, if you, you know, if you wanted to do a setup sort of similar to this and have it mounted to the shock body itself, there's no harming doing that. You can actually buy um, mounting provisions, clamps and stuff to actually mount straight onto the shock body. So, you know, doing something like this might not be, you know, a bad option and it keeps it all as one piece as well. And it's also meaning that you can get through to the adjuster quite easy from the wheel arch area in the back there. So you can get to the adjuster and makes things nice and easy. So honestly, I'm gonna give this setup a go. Um, sorry that I'm not showing you on how to mount them into the car somewhere, but look, these brackets are quite self-explanatory. There's two bolt holes. You can either tech screw them into somewhere or use a nut cert and nut cert them onto somewhere and then mount the uh, reservoir to that using the hose clamps. It's, it's pretty straightforward and there's a lot of hose there to work with. So you can put it in multiple locations. So basically what I've done here is I've just got the, uh, bush, the bush mounts there for the reservoir and just made sure this is a nice loop then grabbing the hose clamps and just feeding the hose clamps through. Don't put it over the braided line, it has to go under the braided line. And we'll just get this one tightened down for now. Just get things started so that it's not flopping around on us. Make sure you get the hose clamps orientated the same way. I don't know if you guys have OCD like me, but it'll do your head in if you do. So you can just do something like this. I mean, as I said, you can even buy, um, you can even buy brackets out there that, that do this, but you do need to make sure you get the right size for the shock. Um, so who knows, Bart's man Dan might eventually do this himself anyway. Um, so that's on there now, I just need to tighten those down, but we'll check it against the other one and make sure it's fairly similar. Now, quick tip, the top bush on this one is rubber. Use a little bit of glass cleaner, just spray it on the inside of the bush like that and that will help locate it onto the stud, onto the locating stud, uh, a lot easier. It won't get bind up and it'll just slide straight on. Now with the bottom one, you don't need to use any because it's got a metal insert. Don't forget we're reusing all the nuts and bolts from the factory assembly, so just put them back into the same spots. Now with the top nut and the washer, this washer has a little bit of a contour to it. The contoured side actually faces out. Okay, so we're gonna install it that way, up onto the top mounting stud and that glass cleaner has made things super easy. And we'll just do the nut up loosely at the moment. Okay, so push up on the shock to get it to line up with the hole. Rightio guys, so that side's on. We've just got to drop the bolts once it's on the ground. Now go ahead and do the exact same thing for the other shock on the other side of the vehicle.
So we're almost done for the rear suspension setup. The last thing to go on is the sway bar extension brackets. Now, basically these are just going to extend the sway bar down because you've lifted the vehicle, it does need to have a bit more reach. You can also do this with aftermarket sway bar links as well and things like that. So this is just a stainless steel bracket to get you out of strife if you wanna use those ones. So they are offset though. So you gotta make sure that you get these the right way around. As you can see, I've got the most uh, offset side to the towards the back of the vehicle. And you can see it only fits on that way. If you try doing it the other way, the hole doesn't line up. So you need to have it facing that way. Then put the bolt through. Actually, we'll go inward. So we'll go bolt through the outside. And like that. Another spring washer. Uh, sorry, another flat washer. And then the nylock nut. Don't need spring washers because of the nylock nuts on there. The sway bar link, the original sway bar link, will go through the bottom hole there and then we'll do that bolt up as well. So go ahead and do up both of those bolts and do the exact same thing on the other side of the vehicle. We're pretty close to being finished now. We've just got to go through and tighten up a few more bolts once we're at ride height, and we have to reattach the breather lines and brake lines if you've also removed those as well. Now. With the breather lines, they're definitely not gonna be long enough at full droop, so I'm gonna to have to install a breather kit, which is fine because I really wanted to do something anyway. So I'm probably gonna get a kit which I can run everything up into the engine bay or somewhere around there and uh, keep the breathers for the gearbox, diffs, transfer. Uh, there might be other things, I'm pretty sure that's it. Keep all those up out of the water and stuff like that because this rig's going to be going through some water. So need to make sure we do that anyway. So that's awesome because it's pushed my hand to get that done. Brake lines are on their way, as I said. So before I go off-roading, I need to change those brake lines or they're going to tear. But for on the road, they'll be perfectly fine. It's only at full maximum droop and things like that that we'll probably run into some issues. So let's go ahead and put those things back on. Now we've got the sway bars on. We can get these back in. They will reach now because they're limited for how far the diff can drop down. I'm just gonna jump underneath the vehicle, tighten off those shock bolts, and that is the installation complete. Alrighty then, guys, that was a massive video. I feel like I need to supply some popcorn with videos like these guys. That was huge installation. Thanks for sticking around till the end. So I've been driving the car around for a week now. I wanted to make sure that when I gave you an outro and a review on the suspension kit, it was an honest one, something that I had tested and made sure was good. Now, as you guys can see, I'm wearing the Comshock shirt that Dan sent me. I'm loving the suspension kit. It moves around really nicely, especially that rear end, guys, that long travel kit. It, the, the diff, the articulation, tucking up into the guard and dropping down is huge. So I'm looking forward to chucking it in some ruts and seeing how it goes. So firstly, I went to Highway Tires. The boys at Highway Tires got the camber adjustment, the wheel alignment, and all that sort of stuff taken care of for me. So no matter how good you think you've got the camber or the wheel alignment uh, yourself adjusting the arms and bits and pieces, just go and get it done by a professional on a machine because it really makes a massive difference to the tire wear, the component wear, and the way that the vehicle handles on the road. Now, some good feedback from the guys at Highway Tires. They, they basically said that the upper control arm ball joint location 
was perfect. I'll put a picture on over this video right now for you guys to have a bit of a look at the percentages and see what adjustments they had to do. They were all pretty minimal. So the guys said they were really stoked with this kit and also the ball joint location, that upper control arm. They just dialed in the, the lower control arm dials and straightened it up a little bit so that the tire was flat to the road surface. So that was all really straightforward. So after I got that done, I drove the vehicle around. I was extremely wrapped with how it was driving on the road, guys. It felt really good. Um, I'm actually really, su really surprised with how it was feeling. I wasn't expecting it to be that good on the road because it is more of an off-road setup, but on-road, it is super comfortable, guys. Dan has done a magnificent job in setting up this suspension kit to suit the weights of my vehicle. And also the heights are spot on. So I've gone around and done all the measurements as well for the height differences between when we started to now, those measurements that we took down. So I've given it that week to settle in and all that sort of stuff. So now I can get a good comparison, everything settled in and the heights are correct. So on the front, Right hand side, so driver's side, we got a uh, increase of 64 mil. And on the left hand side, we got an increase of 74 mil, which is spot on because the left was sitting a little bit lower than the right, so now it's matching. Um, now, if you take into a, uh, consideration the fact I had the strut spaces on my strut assemblies, that is just a bit over a three inch lift, so it's pretty much spot on. Uh, on the rear, I had on the right hand side an increase of 52 mil, and on the left hand side, 51 mil, guys. So that's pretty much spot on to a two inch lift, which exactly which was exactly what I was after. So now the vehicle is sitting and looking level. Everything's running nice and true, guys. So that uh, setup is spot on to it. It's exactly what I wanted. Now, some really important stuff, namely the brake lines. Now, as you guys know, you saw in the video, those brake lines were extremely stretched out, more so when the uh, sway bar was off, but even still, if I take this car off-road as it is with the brake lines like they are, it will, be, it will stretch them and break them. Um, so same with the front guys, they were too stretched out when it was at full droop. So you need to make sure you're checking your brake lines. If you put a suspension lift in the car, you need to put extended brake lines on guys, no matter what. If it's two inch, you need to put two inch. If it's three inch, three inch, four inch, so on. You need to put extended brake lines in there, otherwise you'll run into strife. So I've got my brake lines on the way. I'm getting a full braided brake line set made up for the vehicle and I'll do a full installational video for you, start to finish, bleeding process, installation, all that sort of cool stuff. As you guys saw, on the diffs especially, basically the diff breather itself popped off the diff at full articulation, and it's gonna do that off-road. Now, if that happened, and then I went through a water crossing, it's going to let water straight into the diff. That's why those breathers are there, to give it a higher surface to get air from so that the diff can breathe and, uh, and do all it needs to do. Now, basically, that is not gonna work. So I'm gonna have to put an aftermarket diff breather kit, and I'm gonna do a transfer case and gearbox breather kit as well at the same time. It'll be all one package. I don't know what kit I'm gonna use. I'm a bit stuck on the brand uh, of kit that I want to use for this installation. So if you guys have any recommendations for a good kit, drop them in the comments below, guys. I need some recommendations, and I will do a full installational video on that one start to finish. Now, a hot topic with IFS vehicles is diff drops. Now, diff drops are installed onto lifted IFS vehicles because the CV angles when you lift it go down on more of an angle, which means they've got more chance of being under strain, especially off-road, and they're going to have the risk of breakage or popping out and all that sort of stuff, which leaves you high and dry on the track, guys, if that happens. So, you need to consider if you're going to put a diff drop in your vehicle or not. Now, with a lot of IFS setups, they are quite different. The Nissan Navaras, for instance, the CV angle is actually quite good from factory. Alrighty guys, so the vehicle's on the ground. That's the CV angle back there. So just behind the strut assembly, you can see that's it just there with the boot on it. So that's your CV angle. Now, as you can see, it isn't on a massive angle. So it's actually sitting quite nicely. Now that's the beauty about the MP300s. Nissan have really dialed in these CVs and from factory, they actually sit quite level. And when you raise a vehicle up to about three inches, you usually can get away with not installing a um, diff drop kit. So it's up to you. I'm going to just take this off-road, do a little bit of uh, off-roading, drop it into some ruts and check out the CV angles. If they are dropping too far down, I will install a diff drop, but it looks like from this that I've got plenty of room in those CVs to drop even further without having to worry about them. So if you're doing up to a three inch lift, you know, it's up to you, but you might not need to install a diff drop kit because those angles look pretty awesome, guys. Especially two inch, a two inch lift, don't even worry about a diff drop. Three inches, as I said, I'm gonna to have to have a look into it, but let's, let's take a look at that at a later date when I do an off-road video for you guys. Now, a really important one is retensioning nuts and bolts. Anything that you've touched on the setup, 
go through it and retension it after a couple of days to a week. Now, we put those texture marks down between the bolt and the nut, so we know if the, something uh, starts wiggling loose, you can see that it's changed between that line. So go through, check all the nuts and bolts and do retensioning if you need to. The last thing you want to have happen is something fall out while you're driving on the road or off-road. It'll be an absolute nightmare. So that is really, really important. Thanks heaps for watching, guys. If you found this video helpful, drop it a big thumbs up for me. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button, guys. Tons more content coming your way soon. Now, on that, if you have any ideas for content or something that you want me to cover in a video, drop it in the comments section below, guys. I'll see what I can do. I might be able to do a video on it for you. If you have any questions about this video, also drop them in the comments below, guys. I'll either answer it on another video or answer it directly in the comments below for you. Once again, thanks for watching, guys. This has been another Shed Sessions video. I'll see you in the next one.